Let's just bow our heads once more before we come around the word of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. It's your word. It is you because it tells us who you are and what you are. We lift it up to you today, Heavenly Father, and we pray that you would move through it. Move through it to our hearts and our minds to strengthen our faith. Strengthen us in our understanding. Strengthen us in our motivation to walk this path that our Saviour walked. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are a faithful God. And we can trust you because you are trustworthy. So speak now through your word, Heavenly Father. Let it be done according to your will, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are going to look at covenant number five in our list, which is the Mosaic covenant. The covenant that God made, obviously, with through Moses. And I want to read a scripture before we begin the actual study, and it's this uh, Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17, verses 10 to 12. Leviticus 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. And I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar for an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Now why have I chosen that scripture? I've chosen it because this scripture that comes obviously a little later than what we're going to be looking at highlights the fact that this covenant deals with something different to what we've been looking at to now. This is a covenant of separation covenant of separation and it focuses very much on the matter of sin and of blood we'll see more about that as we go through now the Mosaic covenant contains an awful lot of information and as such we're going to be covering it over two weeks I'm not going to cram it all in today you can say amen to that but we're going to look at it we can't go through everything in every detail, but we're going to be getting a good overview of this covenant because it's important. Now, scripturally, the covenant starts from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. And that's where Moses is called out and commanded. You can look at a few verses of that before we go on. I wasn't going to, but I think it would be pertinent to do so. I'm not going to read it all, but we'll just read up to verse 17. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maidservant, nor thy manservant, sorry, or thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour thy father and thy mother that all that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. His house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbour's. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear instructions there in Exodus. And this really is where the outline of this covenant begins, with these ten commandments as we know them. But we're going to begin by first looking at the, the participants in the covenant. Now, we've already covered that, and we know that it's God and Moses, right? No, actually, it's God and Israel, through Moses. Now, the parties involved are God and Israel. As we'll see later, those who are sealed by circumcision. And you'll see the importance of that and more about that a little later in the message. Now, although on the surface it would appear that Moses would be the representative of Israel. That seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? You know, God is meeting with Moses and therefore God is making this covenant with Moses. And therefore Moses would be the representative of mankind as Noah was, as Adam was and as Abraham was to Israel but in fact Moses was merely the mediator of this covenant this covenant was made with Israel with Israel as we see in the scripture that I'm going to read to you now it's Exodus chapter 19 verses 3 to 8 Exodus 19 verse 3 says this And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called him out of the mountain saying Thus shall thou say unto the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself Now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation a holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel and Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now if you like, the the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, handed over, if you like, to Moses the responsibility of dealing with God. Exodus 20 verse 19 says this. We've just heard of where God spoke in thunder and in fire and in smoke from the mountain. Verse 18 says, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, Speak thou with us. 
and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. The people were afraid. And so they elected, if you like, a majority, I guess, Moses to be their spokesman, to be their mediator, to meet with God, to hear the new covenant and to receive the commandments that we'll see, that we just read previously. Now I want to, I want to try and make it as clear as I can here that this covenant is with Israel. The covenant is with Israel. Not with the church. Not with Gentiles. This covenant is made with the nation and the people of Israel. Okay? Just in case there were any misunderstandings. It's a covenant that God is making with Israel through Moses. Now to back up this statement, I want to look at three different scriptures. So turn with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Just in case you think I may be having you on. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Deuteronomy 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. For what nation is there so great? Who hath God so high unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there? so great that his statutes and judgments so righteous as all his law which is so I set before you this day. It's that one nation. Speaking of one nation. Psalm 147. Psalm 147. You may be there before me. My fingers are pretty slow today. Verses 19 and 20. 147 verses 19 and 20. He showeth his words, speaking of God here, he showeth his word unto Jacob and his judge, who? Israel. He hath, no, he hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. One more. Malachi Chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4, the last book in our Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Quite a few scriptures to look at today. Malachi 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So without any doubt here, this covenant is between God and Israel. Okay? So that's a good start, isn't it? We know who the covenant's with. Now, we're going to look at the provisions of the covenant. And this is where we're going to get quite involved. There's a lot of information. And if you want to jot the scriptures down or jot facts down, please do so. If not, listen to the message again later on now the main provision of this covenant will be quite obvious the main provision of this covenant is the law isn't it the main provision of this covenant is the law and everything in this covenant revolves around the law what's called the law of Moses but it's the law that God gave to Moses to pass on to the nation and the people of Israel. Now it's believed by many that the law is compiled of 613 different laws. That's what Orthodox Judaism holds to and that's what many uh, scholars hold to. That the law is made up of 613 different laws. All this agree, saying nothing. But the main person recognised as being the compiler of this list of 613 different laws is someone known by the acronym Rambam. 
more commonly known as Maimonides, who lived uh, in the year 1135 to 1204 AD. He's believed to be the main one who, uh, or the accepted one, who compiled this list, codified it, wrote it down from oral tradition uh, as these 613 different laws. There are, however, ten commandments. And Jesus said, all the law hangs on these two. I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might, all thy strength, and thy neighbour as thyself. They are two, really, of the ten, aren't they? So, although Orthodox Judaism believes that there are 613, and there are, I'll send everybody a list of them so you can see them for yourselves. Some of them are minor regulations uh, for minor things. Some of them are a bit doubtful, cover things like, thou shall not uh, boil an ox in its mother's milk and things like this, which isn't actually a commandment of God. But I'll leave that aside. We're concentrating on the covenant. On the covenant, sorry. Now, let's take just for granted, just for now, that from Orthodox Judaism, there are 613 altogether. All the minor regulations in which these ten exist. There are several observations that we can make about this list. It's far too many, you'll understand, to go into today. We can't go into depth in 613 laws today, can we? But we can make observations about this list. And the first one is this, about the law. As I've said, they believe there are 613, and in this 613, there are 365 negative laws. Or telling the people to abstain from something. Okay? 365 negative commandments. Telling them to abstain from certain things. Now you'll understand the scepticism in the first part of this because of the kosher regulations which aren't really scriptural as they are today and in this there are 365 negative commandments and therefore there are 248 positive commandments or those demanding obedience to something ok that's a pretty easy sum isn't it 365 248 that's an overall observation we can make about the law if you take in the 613 commandments. Now secondly, because of the nature of this covenant, which is conditional, remember we said about others that were unconditional, that God had said, this is how it's going to be, and he sealed the covenant himself. Yeah? Yeah? That's an unconditional covenant. And we've looked at those. This is a conditional covenant. This gives responsibility for man, or at least Israel, to observe and not to break it. So because of the nature of this covenant being conditional, there would be both blessings for obedience to it and judgments for disobeying, disobeying it. Okay? Let me say that again. Because of the nature of the covenant, there would be both blessings for obedience, I'm over here, and judgments for disobedience. Now we're going to look at this in two scriptures Exodus 15, verse 26. We could go right through, actually, to uh, Exodus 19, but we won't. Exodus 15, verse 26 says this. 
and said, If they will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen? That hasn't changed, by the way. He's still the Lord who heals you. And so we can see that there are blessings for obedience, judgments for disobedience. And if we were to go through to uh, Deuteronomy 27 and 28, we'd see a far more clear picture of that. With the blessings and the curses, they were to be part of the law. We won't go into that today. But number three... So this, as I read out at the beginning, do you remember I read Leviticus 17? Or a portion of Leviticus 17. As I read out there, blood, a major element of the Mosaic Covenant is animal sacrifice. And as a result, the blood from those animals. Now, Leviticus chapters 1 to 7 sets out five different offerings of animals for blood. I'm not going to go into that today. We haven't got time. But in Leviticus 1, verse 4, turn with me to that. Leviticus 1, verse Leviticus 1 verse 4 says this, And he, that is the priest, shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Do you all see that? To make atonement. Now that word atonement is actually, the English word atonement is a made up name. It's a made up name from the words at one meant at one meant because that's the closest they could get to the Hebrew word and the Hebrew word is kafar kafar and it means the following to cover specifically with bitumen to expiate or condone to placate to appease to atone to cleanse to disannul Uh, to give pardon or pity, to purge, to reconcile. And I hope we can see there that it means to cover, not to remove. That word there has the meaning of covering, hiding, not taking away. And it says that because it could only be a temporary covering. For sin. A temporary covering for sin. Because we know the ultimate covering for sin, the ultimate dealing with sin is through the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's taken away through the blood of Christ Jesus. Not through the blood of the Mosaic Covenant. The blood of the Mosaic Covenant covers from the sight of God. It was poured, the blood of the animals was poured on the mercy seat. And it was poured on the mercy seat as a covering from the eyes of God to the law that was sitting inside the box. It was there between the law and God. The blood was a temporary covering. Yes, there was forgiveness. But it was no permanent dealing with the sin. It had to be done over and over and over again. Day after day. Can you imagine the amount of animals just in the 40 years wandering in the desert that had to be slaughtered to cover the sin of the people of Israel? Twice a day. 
regular offerings besides other offerings many many animals slaughtered to temporarily cover the sin of man but it was to point to something else this covenant as I said is is a covenant of separation but it's also a covenant that would point man specifically Israel to something in the distance that permanent dealing with sin when sin would be dealt with once and for all the law is our schoolmaster Paul says that leads us to Christ the law shows us our sinfulness the law reveals our wretchedness before a holy God but the blood of bulls and goats and sheep could never take away that sin It could never satisfy the wrath of God for sin. Only the blood of the Lamb of God himself, Jesus Christ, could do that. So in this covenant, the covering of sin is all that the Old Testament believer could expect. The blood did not take away sin. It covered it. Only through the blood of the Lamb of God could the removal of sin be achieved. As I've said, the covering of sin did offer forgiveness of sin. Also, on a temporary basis. But God forgave. He turned a blind eye, as it were, to sin because of the blood. And it also brought restoration of fellowship. The blood cleansed, it covered, and it also brought about restoration of fellowship to those who maybe had been infirm or those who had been leprous. Blood was shed to cleanse them and bring them back into fellowship. So that's number three. Number four, the dietary restrictions that were imposed in the law. Now this is an interesting one. That are different to that of the Noahic covenant. Do you remember in the Noahic covenant, Noah was told that they could eat anything. Any animal, any plant, Anything was fine for him to eat. It's not so in this covenant. There are different dietary regulations. And that's what we're going to look at now. Regarding the different animals that could be eaten. Now the animals or the beasts that could be eaten had to have cloven or split hooves and chew the cud. They had to have both. Not just one or the other. They had to have both. They had to have cloven hooves and chew the cud like a cow or a bull or a sheep or a goat. Whereas fish had to be the only ones that were allowable, let's say, permissible, were those both with scales and with fins. Scales and fins. So you couldn't eat an eel. Because it didn't have scales. But you could eat a perch, let's say. Or a chub, or a salmon. Okay? Um, Birds of prey were not permitted. And of the insects, only one type of locust was permitted to be eaten. There are lots of different regulations concerning the diet and this is where we get into um, oral tradition with Orthodox Judaism and the regular kosher regulations which unfortunately vary 
precepts. Kosher in the Bible was the way that the animal was killed. Okay? There weren't different types of salt. There wasn't kosher salt or kosher kosher orange juice or things like that. Kosher was just the way the animal was slaughtered. And it's quite interesting that when Lynn and I were in Israel, we had many discussions with, with Jews about kosher. And one thing that I used to bring up was Do you remember when Abraham met the three visitors outside the tent before they went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you remember? Moses met them, didn't he? He said, I'll prepare, we'll get a meal prepared. Stay and have a meal with us. If you take a look at the meal that was prepared, it was meat and dairy. And it was accepted by the angels which is, in today's thought, is non-kosher. But they accepted it. So make of that what you will. But number five, the death penalty, or the scope of the death penalty, was expanded. Now if you remember, in, back in the, uh, the covenant of Noah, uh, there was judgments allowed to be made for murder. Do you remember that? Judgments were allowed to be made in cases of murder. Now, in this covenant, the death penalty, uh, such crimes as idolatry, adultery, cursing God, cursing parents, breaking the Sabbath, practicing witchcraft, and so on and so on, were added to that and for all these idolatry, adultery and so on the death penalty was instituted so the scope of this death penalty was expanded I said at the beginning that this was a a covenant of separation and I want you to see and try and understand the, the motive of God behind this covenant God was taking a people who had been in bondage in Egypt, slaves, servants in Egypt for over 400 years. They were slaves, servants to the Egyptians and had been for generations. And they came out of Egypt still slaves, still in bondage here still having Egypt here and in some cases here in the heart and so God had to take this people his people and separate them not just from Egypt but from the world's way of thinking the world's way of acting the world's standards the world's world's moral standards if there were any at the time. Can you see that? God had to separate them, not just from Egypt, but but the ways of Egypt and the thinking of Egypt. And he had to teach them about himself. He was going to be their God. And he was pure. He is pure. He is holy. He is love. He is absolute love. He is absolute peace. He is absolute joy. He is absolute holiness. There is no darkness in him. And to come before him, there had no blemish to come into his presence. And this was the idea of the Mosaic law, the beginnings of this process of making Israel the people of God. A light to the nations from whom the Son of God would spring to bring ultimate salvation, to bring ultimate freedom from the bondage and power of sin. And so this process really began with the Mosaic Covenant. And God is teaching them 
His standards. What it means to come into His presence. And we only have to look at the fact that the high priest, the high priest, the most holy priest in the nation of Israel was only allowed to come into that presence, into the Holy of Holies, once a year. Once a year. And then with fear and trembling, with a rope tied around his ankle, bells on his garments, in case any sin or uncleanness or fault was found in him and he'd be struck dead on the spot. They'd have to drag him out. God is a holy God. Still is a holy God. And these, as he is revealing them, are his standards. What it means to come into his presence. And so, to get back to the to the message, struggle with preaching, you get lost in the word. But the death penalty, the scope of the death penalty was expanded to include such as idolatry, adultery, cursing God, cursing parents, breaking the Sabbath, which we'll talk about more in a minute, practicing witchcraft. Now, practicing witchcraft isn't just what just making, it also means meddling in other people's affairs. That's witchcraft. Number six. The sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant. Remember the sign of the covenant of Noah? Can anybody remember what that was? The rainbow. Yeah. The covenant with Abraham. What was the sign of that? Circumcision. So what's the sign of the Mosaic covenant? Well... It's circumcision, but there's a different reason now. The sign of the covenant was circumcision, but for a different reason. Leviticus 12, verse 3. Leviticus 12, verse 3. And in the eighth day... The flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And shall and she shall then continue in the blood of a purifier. Oh sorry. Yeah. That's after birth. The eighth day. That was the under the Abrahamic covenant, it was a token of the covenant agreement, and it was for Jews only. Okay? It was done on the eighth day. Do you remember we said last time that that differentiated circumcision for Jews or for Hebrews then to circumcision done by any other group. The fact that it was done on the eighth day. That's what's remembered here in Leviticus. It's done on the eighth day. And only in Judaism is it done so. Now, Now it was to be to the, now it was a means of submission to the law. That was the focus now of circumcision. And we're going to look at that in a moment. It was mandatory for Jews. Mandatory for Jews, but also now for non Jews who wanted to join themselves to the nation of Israel. Okay? So keep that Can you see that expansion there? There's a different meaning now about circumcision in this covenant. It is mandatory for Jews, but it also, for non-Jews, Gentiles, or whatever, who want to come in to sojourn, to be a part of the nation of Israel. And this is believed to be the reason, I believe to be the reason, for the Apostle Paul telling believers in his letter to the Galatians that if they gave in and were circumcised by the Judaizers at that time, that they were then obliged to keep the law, every part of it. Okay? Turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 
chapter 5. Verses 1 to 6. Galatians 5 verse 1 says this, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Did you know you're free? You have liberty in Christ Jesus. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And Paul goes on, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, this is in the flesh, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is come, become of no effect unto you. Whomsoever of you are justified by the law are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh love. Paul talking there obviously about the circumcision in the flesh for men. But we know that the circumcision in the new life in Christ is circumcision of the heart. We see that laid out for us in in the new covenant that we'll see at a a later date. But it's in Jeremiah 31. New heart. It's circumcision of the heart that is important in the new covenant. But circumcision in the Mosaic or under the Mosaic covenant, under the law now, the law of Moses, meant the total Obedience to that law. The whole law. And any breaking of that law had to be dealt with by the death of an animal and the shedding of its blood to temporarily cover that sin. I hope you get the idea of that now. Many of you probably knew that already. But this was the new emphasis of circumcision. It wasn't just for the Jews, not just for the Hebrews of Israel. It was for all those who would be joined to them because now they would come under the law of Moses. Now the token of the covenant, which is where I, I sort of misinformed you last time, the token of the covenant, that was the the sealing, if you like, of the covenant. With the Noahic covenant was the rainbow. With Abrahamic, it was circumcision. But now with the Mosaic covenant, the token of it was the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Now, about the Sabbath, we can find five different things to examine five different things to look at I'm not going to be able to get through them all today but we'll just look through a few for now and there are some scriptures references here so if you want to jot them down please do we're just going to be going through the first three of these five observations if you like about the Sabbath first of all It was a sign that Israel had been set apart by God. Exodus 31, let's just read that one. Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death, For whosoever doth any work therein, 
that soul shall be cut off from amongst his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, whosoever doth any work in the Sabbath holy. Well, I'll I'll read verse 17 because it's appropriate. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So it's important. It's a sign that Israel has been set apart by God and for God. It was also a sign of the Exodus. Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 to 15. I'm not going to read that now. It was a sign of the Exodus. Next, it was a sign also that Yahweh was Israel's God. Yahweh. Not Jehovah. Yahweh. I am. Was Israel's God. uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 20. You will see that. It should also be remembered that every reason for keeping the Sabbath only has relevance for Israel. Let me repeat that. Every reason for keeping the Sabbath only has relevance for Israel and for the Jews. Because who was this covenant made with? Israel. It doesn't hold for Gentiles and it doesn't hold for the church. Because if we read Hebrews 4, we'll see that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Isn't he? Matthew 12, verse 8. Mark 2, verse 28. And Luke 6, verse 5. Jesus stating that he is Lord of the Sabbath. He is our Sabbath. In him we have rest. Secondly, the Sabbath was not an ordinance from creation. Now I want this to be understood and I want to make it as clear as I can. Sabbath, the Sabbath was not an ordinance from creation. It only became statutory as a rest day in the Mosaic Covenant. If we look at what's stated in Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3, we'll see that only what God did on that day is stated. God rested or relented from his work and so made it holy. Okay? Is that clear? We only see that what God did. There's no emphasis for man to keep that day. In the order of creation. Only when we come to the Mosaic Covenant do we see an ordinance that demands that the Sabbath day be kept. That no work be done on that day. Keeping the Sabbath began in Exodus 16. Turn to that with me. Exodus 16, verse 23. I'm going over these because I think they're important for us to know and to understand. Exodus 16, verse 23. I'll read through to verse 30. Exodus 16, verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and seethe that you will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up until the morning, and Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? 
See, for that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So, clearly see there that the statutory regulation began with the covenant of Moses, that no work should be done. And that brings me to my third point. There is, interestingly, but but nevertheless, important observation about the Sabbath. The Sabbath according to the law, the law that we've just read, the law given to Moses for Israel, was to be a day of rest. Is that right? Everybody understand that? It was to be a day of rest, not a day of corporate worship. It was to be a day of rest. No one was to leave their home. No work was to be done on the Sabbath day. It was a day of ceasing from all work. A day of rest. Nothing is said about it being for corporate worship. It's interesting because in Judaism it became the day of corporate worship. Now I'm an observation, a fact here. What God says it's to be a day of rest. As the day uh, was further developed in the law, what God intended was the prohibition of work. And I want you to understand, I want you to see that by these few points that I've made here. And there are scripture references, if you want to jot them down. Exodus 16, verses 23 to 30, we just read it. There was to be no gathering of manna. These are the stipulations of God about the Sabbath day. No gathering of manna. Exodus 16, verse 29, said there was to be no travelling, no outward movement from the home. Exodus 35, verse 3, said that that there was to be no making or building of a fire. Numbers 15, verse 32, says that there was to be no gathering of wood. In fact, someone was stoned to death for gathering wood on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. There were other restrictions not contained in the law per se, the sections that we're, we're looking at today, but there were other restrictions not contained in the law per se, such as these three. Jeremiah 17 verse 21, speaks of there being no carrying of a burden on the Sabbath day. No carrying of a burden on the Sabbath day. Amos 8, verse 5, said that there was to be no trading, no business done, in other words, on the Sabbath day. And finally, Nehemiah 10, verse 31, and Nehemiah 13, Verses 15 and 19 state that there was to be no marketing as such. Now in spite of all this, nothing was on the Sabbath, but rather a cessation of all labour. Do we all understand that? It's pretty clear, isn't it, really? Now the synagogue worship that we see today uh, amongst the Jewish people, those in, uh, still in exile and those within Israel itself we see that there is corporate worship on the Sabbath day on the Saturday now synagogue worship that we see in the New Testament was a development which had its origins if you like it began in the Babylonian captivity where they were away from Israel there was no temple there was no ark And they developed the synagogue system of worship around the law, the reading of the word and prayer. And that's pretty much what it is to this day. 
with a few alterations. But the synagogue worship began back in the Babylonian captivity and not in the time of Moses and not within the covenant that God made through Moses. Do we all understand that? So, the Sabbath day is a day of rest. And once we understand that, we can see clearly why it's so important. Because Jesus is our rest. He fulfilled all the law of Moses and bought that rest for us. We can rest in him because he has satisfied the wrath of God once and for all by his blood shed. The pure, spotless, faultless Lamb of God allowed his blood to be shed to take away your sin and my sin once and for all. Not temporarily, but permanently. Aren't you glad in that? Next time we're going to continue with the, the Mosaic Covenant. We're going to finish the, uh, the last uh, two observations. And then we're going to also look at the purpose of the law and some other factors. We could spend far more time on, on this covenant to do it real justice to its importance. But I hope you've got some idea of the law of Moses, the covenant that God made with Moses to start the process of his people being separated out from the world to himself. A holy nation. Kingdom of priests. A people belonging to God. And that's your inheritance today. Through the spotless Lamb of God. Your sin has been taken away by that spotless lamb. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you don't have to kill a lamb or a goat or a cow <laughs> anymore? No more blood has to be shed. It was done once and for all by the spotless lamb of God. And we'll continue with that next time. But for now, God bless you.